Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Would you know what to say if your telephone should ring like this? Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Uh, just last Wednesday, my Equitable representative told me about a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. Believe me, that's one great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Wayward Brothers. It is the business of your FBI to investigate crime. And in the carrying out of that business, it is necessary that they know as much as possible about the habits of the criminal. Because crime prevention is also a part of the work done by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A recent study undertaken by your FBI revealed a fact which will seem odd to those of you who are law-abiding citizens. There are seasons in crime. Seasons, just as there are in every other business. During the winter months, the criminal concentrates on crimes against property. Crimes like auto theft, armed robbery, and arson. But in the spring and summer months, in this season of the year, the criminal's fancy turns to people. And the fashion is to commit crimes against the person. Crimes like extortion, kidnapping, and murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small private plane that's flying over the desert wasteland of one of our southwestern states. A young man is seated at the controls of the plane. He speaks to a girl who sits beside him. Sue? Yes, honey? See that mesa down there on the left? Yes. That's our landmark. Oh. 20 minutes more and we're at the ranch. <laughs> I'm kind of sorry to hear that. I've really enjoyed this flight so much. Well... I hope you'll enjoy the ranch, too. Well, of course I will. Ned. Hmm? There's something I think I'd better tell you right now. Well? It's about your mother and dad. Ned, I... I'm scared to death about meeting them. <laughs> Are you kidding? Why, they're the sweetest guys you'll oh, ever... I, I know all that. But, well, you're their only son... We're engaged. And they'll love it. I hope so. Oh, Susie, baby, will you please? 
Hey. Is trouble, honey? I don't know. Yeah. We got trouble. What do we do? Oh, just stay where you are, honey. Keep calm. I will. I don't think this motor's coming back. We're now at about 800 feet. I'm going to try to set it down easy. Well, you've got plenty of landing fields. Miles and miles of desert. Yeah, it isn't as flat as it looks from here. Well, if we're lucky, we'll hit a good spot. I see. Tighten your safety belt, Sue. Sure. I'm afraid we're losing altitude too fast. I'm going to try to set it down right. If I could just level her off a little more. Ned, we're going to crash. Easy, baby. Ned! Ned! <laughs> Uh, hold it, Slim. Whoa, boy. There. There's our plane. I told you I'd seen it fall. Yeah. Let's have a look at it. It plowed into the sand pretty deep. Yeah. Do you think there's people in it, Chuck? I don't know. Well, let's have a look. Oh, it stayed in one piece anyway. Yeah. Uh, this looks like a door right here. I'll, I'll try it. Anybody in there? Yeah. Yeah, there's two of them. A man and a female. Alive? Well, I'll see. The man's breathing. That shows the female. Anything else in there? I'm just looking around. Wait. Here, here's some bags. I'll pass them on out to you. Okay. Here you are. Here's one of them. Right. And, uh, here. Here's the other. I got it. What about the people? What about them? Don't you want to search them before we go through the bags? Nope. Why not? Well, I'm lifting the people out, too. What for? So as we can tend to them. What's got into you? Nothing. Why don't we take what we can here and just leave them be? Take a look at them bags, Slim. They cost plenty. So does a private airplane. So what? Well, these folks must be worth money. We'll get lots more out of being nice to them. I don't go along with that. Nobody's asking you to, Slim. That's just how we're doing it. Now, give me a hand. Some 50 miles away from the scene of the plane crash in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is about to leave on an assignment. Say, hey, Jim. Oh, yes, Bud. Where are you going? Following up a report that just came in from the Indian agent down in Tevis. What about? Well, there was a murder committed on the reservation last night. A man's body was found early this morning. What's the story? Well, the victim was an archaeologist. His name was Adams. He came in from the east about three weeks ago. He planned to spend the summer on the reservation. I see. Did he work alone? Yes. How was he killed? Stabbing. Was he in a fight? I don't know, Pat. There hasn't been much evidence collected to date. When was he last seen? Yesterday afternoon. He was believed to have been in the company of two other men. Any idea who they were? Oh, not yet. But I think we have the motive, all right. What is it? Robbery. I understand that it was generally known that this man Adams carried quite a bit of cash. Oh. And when his body was found, his effects were pretty well ransacked. But ironically enough, the thieves never did find his money. How was that? Well, he wore a belt around his waist, and his assailant didn't search him that closely. Well, Jim, these two men that Adams was riding with sound like pretty good suspects. Pat, I can give you a better answer to that after I've been down there. Take it easy, mister. Huh? Just lie still. Where... Where am I? In a cabin. My, my leg. I think it's busted. How did... Wait. Where's Sue? Well, where is she? The uh, gal who was in the plane with you? Yes. She's right in the next room. How is she? Still passed out. 
What's wrong? Is she injured? What is it? I don't know. Help me up. I'll, I'll go in. I told you that leg was busted. Who's with Sue? Is anyone taking care of her? No. Nope. Why not? Look, we took you both from the airplane. Wasn't that enough? Oh, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I I'm very grateful, too. No, okay. Is this your cabin? No, but we're staying in it. Where's my plane? About uh, ten miles from here. How far from a town are we? About thirty miles. Who else is here besides yourself? My brother, Chuck. Have you a car? No. Horses. What? Could one of you go into town at once? What for? A doctor. The young lady who is with me must need one. It looks as though I do, too. Well, I'll see what my brother says. Where is he? Outside. Oh, oh, please, call him in here. I'll talk to him first. Tell him I'll pay him well for his trouble. I'll tell him. I'll be back. Is that you, Slim? Yeah. Well, how are they? The fellas come, too. Oh? He asked me to come out and talk to you. For her? He wants that one of us should go into town for a doctor. Did you tell him how far it was? Yeah. He said he'd pay you well for your trouble. How much? I didn't ask. You been going through the bag? Uh, yeah. Find anything? Well, no dough, but I've been reading these letters. This fellow's family's real rich. Where are they located? On a ranch, 30-odd miles from here. You gonna talk to him about getting a doctor? Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk. Don't forget, he said it pay. Slim, he's going to pay plenty. Hello, Pat. Hi, Jim. Pick up anything down Tennis? Yes, I was lucky enough to find the knife that the killer used. There were several good prints on the handle. Say, what about the two men on horseback? Oh, I just got a general description on them, Pat. Nothing really worthwhile. I'm going to get these prints off to the laboratory at once. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? I'm sending out a set of prints myself. No? What on? Well, a call came in right after you left this morning. A family named Robinson. Hmm. They have a ranch about 20 miles out of town. They reported that their son had left Denver yesterday in his own plane. His fiance was with him. Yes. And the plane was to arrive at the ranch early last evening. After it was several hours overdue, searching parties were sent out. I see. Early this morning, the plane was spotted from the air. The pilot landed, examined young Robinson's plane, and found it empty. Well... He noticed, however, that there were bloodstains in the cabin and numerous prints of horses' hooves around the plane. He returned and reported this to the boy's family. Pat, where did Robinson's plane land? On the uh, Indian reservation. That's oh. why the family called here. Did you go out and look it over? Yeah. Did you find anything? Just the fingerprints I mentioned before. Well, Pat, I wouldn't say that either one of us had an easy assignment, so let's go to work. <laughs> Go on in, Slim. Okay. Hey, where is he? Huh? He was stretched right out there on that bunk. He's gone. Well, now, he didn't come out. We was right by the door. Yeah, but... Oh, he's probably in the next room with his girlfriend. But he couldn't walk. That leg of his. Yeah, he got in here all right. See? Yeah. Huh. Mister, this here is my brother. Hello. Hi. I thought you couldn't walk. I couldn't. I sort of dragged myself in here. I knew my fiancé would need me. She's still out? Yes. What about a doctor? Will Ooh. you get one? Well, uh, that sort of depends, mister. On what? On uh, what it's worth to you. Well, that's unimportant. Name your price. Okay. Uh, $10,000. What? You heard me. What? That's sheer robbery. If that's how you feel, mister, you don't have to pay. We don't have to get no doctor. Oh, now, look. 
You can see for yourself this girl is desperately in need of help. Mm-hmm. Oh, please be reasonable. She's your girl, mister. Why don't you help her? Sure. Go get the doctor yourself. Oh, you know that's impossible. You know I can just barely move. Then it looks like you better pay. I haven't got it. You can get it easy enough. Just write a note to your family. I happen to know their ranch is nearby. Tell them to put up the money. Slim here can deliver the note. Oh, they wouldn't stand for anything like that. Then I guess the girl don't get no doctor. Look, you have horses here. I'll go into town myself. No, oh, you just stay put. No, let go of me. Let me get out. Oh, no. No. When he comes to Slim, he'll ride his family. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to people on the way up, to the man who will soon phone his wife to tell her good news like this. Listen, honey, I've just seen the Acme Company. They've offered me the job. And boy, what an increase in salary. Yes, that's one of the great moments of life. And when it happens to you, when you finally achieve the success you're working and planning for, make sure you have life insurance designed to order for you. Right now, investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now than they are today. Does that mean that this equitable plan is flexible, considers both my present and my future? Exactly right. And that's just one of several advantages of this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second... This equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. Can expand or contract as you see fit. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. How can I get the whole story? The easiest way is to get in touch with your equitable society representative. Phone him as soon as possible and ask him for full details on the equitable plan for people on the way up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Wayward Brothers. As you have seen aptly illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reasoning with the criminal mind, for there is neither logic nor compassion in the makeup of the criminal. The human being has no dignity as an individual to the criminal because he has chosen to live his life outside the conventions set up and obeyed by his fellow beings. That lack of regard for his fellow man is the basic reason for the lack of success of every criminal. For one thing is as true in crime as it is in every other field of life. And that is that unless we have a common and mutual loyalty, we are doomed. Because no one person is entirely self-sufficient. To rephrase that point which the criminal can never understand, we are indeed our brother's keeper. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk reading a laboratory report. Finishing it, he jumps excitedly to his feet and calls out. Pat! Oh, Pat! Yeah, Jim? Come on in here a minute, will you? Charlie. What do you want? Take a look at this report that just came in from the laboratory. On the fingerprints you sent? On the prints we both sent them. They're identical, Pat. What? Yes, they both belong to the same man. Well, what do you know? Who is it? A man named Charles Elgin, also known as Chuck Elgin. What's his background? He was arrested about 12 years ago for a bank job. He's also been in trouble with local police in several states. I see. He's always worked with his brother. His name is John Elgin, also known as Slim. Then they could be the two men who were seen with Adams that afternoon before he was murdered. I would think so, yes. I've got a complete description here on both of them. They must have come across the disabled plane. Yes. And they undoubtedly took young Robinson and his girlfriend along with them. Right. Say, does that report have anything on where they can be found, where they live? No, but they're from these parts originally. 
The local police can probably help us on that. Yeah. Pat, I'll send out an alarm on these men. Good. While you're doing that, I'll run over and talk to the police. Chuck? Oh, coming around. Hand me that dipper of water. Sure. His girlfriend was just moaning a little. I think she's coming around, too. Uh, leave her alone in there. I don't want him to see her again until he writes the note. Okay. Here, give me that water. Uh, Here. Uh, please, please. Yeah, uh, that done it. I... Oh. I'm still here. Yeah, that's right. Where's Sue? We moved you out of her room. Is she still unconscious? Yeah. Look, won't you listen to reason? Please, go and get a doctor. I I told you before, we'd be glad to. You still want $10,000? That's right. Feel like writing that note now, mister? Look, I... Time's passing, you know. Okay. I'll write it. Well... That's better. You got a pencil, Slim? Yeah. No paper, though. Well, there's a bag over there. Go get it. Right. What will I say in the note? I'll tell you what to write. Well, here's the bag. Okay. Now, you can write it right there on the floor. Here. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> dear folks, some good people saved my life. I'm staying with him. Got that okay? Uh-huh. Uh, what's your girl's name? Sue. Then say, uh, me and Sue are okay. I want to pay these good people for helping me. Give the man who brings this note $10,000. You got all that? This note, $10,000. Uh-huh. Then say, uh, he will tell you, uh, let you know where we are. And don't tell the police about this. Then sign your name. But what about the doctor? When they pay the dough, you'll get one. But the whole purpose of writing this note is to get a doctor. Now! Look, just sign your name. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. This is Pat. Oh, yes, Pat. How did you make out? Well, I spent most of the afternoon here at police headquarters. Been trying to get some line on the Elgin brothers. Any luck? Well, someone reported seeing them down near Tevis the day before yesterday. I see. And they do have horses. The police say they know the desert country like a book. Well, then they must be hiding out in that wasteland somewhere. We... Oh, excuse me, Pat. Yep. Hold on a second when your message just came in. Right. Hey. Hey, Pat. Looks like we may be getting some action. What is it? This message is from Robinson's parents. They just received a phone call from a man who claimed he's got a note from their son. Really? Yes. He told them he'd be right out to see them. Pat, I'd better get right over to their ranch. What happened, Jim? Well, I've had a busy two hours. Did you get out to Robinson's ranch in time? In time to wait. What do you mean? The man who called him never showed up. Oh, that's too bad. It was one of the Elgin brothers, all right. How do you know? Well, when the man didn't appear, I questioned the Robinsons about the phone conversation. They recall that he said he was telephoning from a blacksmith shop. Yeah? Well, there was only one blacksmith in their village, so I went over there. Yeah, I see. The blacksmith told me that Elgin had left his horse there to be shod and said he'd be back in about an hour. When was all this? About two hours ago. Did Elgin return? Yes, he came back in five minutes. The blacksmith said he seemed highly nervous. Elgin urged him to finish the job quickly, and as soon as it was done, he rode away. Did the blacksmith learn where he was going? No, but he did say he had a 30-mile ride. Oh, that doesn't tell us much. Pat, it could if he hasn't had too much of a start. We've got an idea. Now, this is what I think you should Sue. Sue, darling. Why? It's all right, baby. I'm right here with you. I'm right beside you, darling. Oh, Ned. Oh, baby. Ned, where... Where are we? We're gonna be okay, honey. But the plane... What happened? Well, after we cracked up, two men came along. 
took us here to this cabin. Oh. You... You passed out for a while. That's all. Oh. Ned, what, what's happened to you? I... I hurt my leg a little, that's all. Oh, Ned. There's a doctor coming soon. We'll both be tended to. But what about me? Wait. Well, she come too, huh? Yes. What about your brother? Oh, he's coming back. I just seen him riding down the hill. Alone? Yep. No doctor? Look, that happens after the payoff, remember? Oh, what's he talking about? Nothing, honey. Well, what does he mean, payoff? I'll, I'll explain it all to you later. Charlie! Charlie! I'm in here! Well, how'd you make out? No good. What, what happened? Wouldn't they pay? I never delivered the note. Why not? I seen this newspaper before I went there. Look. What is it? Our picture's right on the front page. Before? Knocking that guy off. The FBI found out we'd done it. Oh. We gotta blow out of here, Chuck. Fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about them? They stay here. Ned, what's this all about? These men wanted money. Ten thousand dollars. Why? So you could get out of here alive, sweetheart. And we didn't get it. You still can't leave us here like this. I ain't going to. But you just said... I said I was leaving you here. I didn't say how. Chuck, we're wasting time. I know. Wait a minute. What are you going to do? What do you think? Put away that gun. Only after I'm done with it. But Ned... Shut up. Get it over with, will you? Okay. Drop that gun, Elton. Huh? Drop it! Ah! Oh. Now raise your hands, both of them. Who are you? I'm from the FBI. Oh, thank heaven. How'd you get here? We knew you had a 30-mile ride. And as much as planes travel faster than horses, we circled in a 30-mile radius until we picked up your trail. All right, Pat. Let's get these people out of here. Chuck Elgin and his brother Slim were both tried and found guilty of murder on a government reservation and sentenced to execution. The manner in which these criminals were caught illustrates how little chance the criminal has competing against the forces of law and order. For in this case, the criminals used horses and your FBI employed an airplane. With every field of science at their disposal, the various agencies of law enforcement, your local police, your state troopers, and the special agents of your FBI have cut the chances for criminal success down to the barest minimum, have proved again and again that crime is always an unprofitable career. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. Or how much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Professional Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor is played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The professional killer on This Is Your FBI.
Stay tuned now as contestants try for an amazing $2,000 jackpot on radio's biggest money-paying quiz show, Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has anyone ever phoned you to check up on the radio program you've got tuned in? It happens like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. The Equitable Society has a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. That's one great life insurance plan so naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Swindler. There is nothing remarkable about the fact that there are various classes of criminals. Because in any group of six million people, there would have to be different shadings of character and mentality. Rated on top are bank robbers, mob leaders, and killers. They are in the business of crime, and they engage in their work for profit. Their standing in the criminal community depends almost entirely on their degree of success. But there is one type of criminal to whom everyone else in the crime world looks up. Because he, or she, makes his living by his brains. And that criminal is the swindler. Tonight's FBI file opens aboard a transcontinental train that is heading westward. In the club car, a distinguished-looking gray-haired man is sipping a tall, cool drink. In a chair beside him, an attractive young woman dressed in black is nervously twisting her kerchief. Uh, I... I beg your pardon. Yes? Uh, could you tell me the time? Why, certainly. It's, uh, exactly 3.27. I is that central time? Oh, no, no, mountain time. We've just entered the new zone. Oh, <laughs> That always confuses me. Well, that's very natural, my dear. Is this your first trip west? Oh, no. No, I lived in Colorado when I was a child. I haven't been back in years. I'm sure you'll enjoy your return. It's a glorious country. This... This is not a pleasure trip. Oh? Oh, good heavens. Please forgive me, dear child. I just noticed you were wearing mourning. Quite all right. Someone near and dear to your heart? My father. I'm sorry. You're uh, returning for the funeral? No, no, no. He died back east. I'm visiting his lawyer to settle the estate. I see. I sure wish I knew more about such things. Why, my dear? What's your problem? Well, here's a letter I received from the lawyer. I can't make any sense out of it. Here, see if you can. Surely. All that stuff there about options, mining properties. I just don't get it. Well, now, uh, this is all quite clear. Uh -huh. uh, your father has the right to, had the right to exercise his option on some rather valuable mining property. But uh, what's that stuff about $10,000? Well, that's what it will cost you if you care to exercise the option. Oh. Say, I see that this lawyer's in Colorado Springs. Yes, that's where I'm going. So am I. Oh? Oh, dear. That's first call for dinner. 
I'm afraid I shall have to cut short this delightful chit-chat. Are you uh, walking back this way? Well, I'll follow you a few paces. My compartment is in this car. I think it's wonderful that we're both going to the same place. Indeed it is. I hope I'll run into you there. I'll be at the Central Hotel. If I can be of any assistance to you, give me a ring. But I don't know your name. Heavens, that's right. We neglected to introduce ourselves. I'm Colonel Lansing. I'm Rose Dixon. Pleasure, Miss Dixon. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is my compartment here. I'm afraid I shall have to say good day. Oh, well, good day, Colonel. I will call you. Splendid. Greetings, my love. Where have you been? I have just had a most delightful experience. Well? <laughs> little lady just tried to promote me out in the lounge. <laughs> Is that wonderful? Someone playing me for a sucker? I'm not surprised. What do you mean? It's been so long since you've made a score yourself, you're beginning to look square. Now, Edith. I thought you were going to sit in the lounge to do some promoting yourself. I intended to, but the little lady's technique intrigued me. <laughs> look, you'd better get intrigued with making a buck for us. Because I'm telling you right now, if you don't get some action at Colorado Springs, I withdraw my financial support. Edith, what a ghastly thing to say before dinner. In the Denver field office of the FBI, Special Agent Jim Taylor is reading a teletype that has just come in. Jim, you looking oh. for me? Oh, yes, Carl. We've just been given an assignment. Oh, what is it? Well, most of the story is right here in this teletype. Let's go into the office here and review it, huh? Right. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks. Well, what have we got? A swindle, Carl. So far, it's been worked exclusively on transcontinental trains. Yes? And briefly, the operation is this. A young woman dressed in mourning clothes contacts victim on train. Victim is usually gullible male. Naturally. She explains that she's on way to settle father's estate. She flashes a letter which reveals that Pop has an option on some valuable mining property. I see. That's all that happens on the train. She and victim wind up in the same town. She contacts victim, says father has only left her $5,000, and she needs 10000 to exercise options. Will victim put up the additional five? Now, does a phony lawyer turn up? That's right. Girl and victim each give lawyer their 5000 and then swindling couple disappears. I remember a similar operation when I worked out of Boston. I know. It's a pretty familiar pattern, Carl, but unfortunately it never is to the victim. And what's our assignment? Uh, those people here in town? No, but they're on their way. Chicago office sent this teletrust. The couple boarded a train yesterday bound for here. Any description on it? Yes, very complete. What are they doing? Hey, the train arrives in half an hour. We should be getting down to the station right now. Is that you, Albert? Yeah. Well, gee, where have you been? I've been worried about you. When did you get here? About two hours ago. I thought you were going to meet me at the train. I didn't say anything of the kind. I told you to come right here to the hotel. Oh. Well, how'd you do? Okay. You promoted a guy? Yeah. He's a very nice man. What's his name? Oh, well, let's see now. I think it was Colonel Lansing. You think it was? Yeah. Oh, brother. I got it written down someplace. Would you show him the letter? Yeah. Did he go for it? Well, he said I could call him. Where? One of the hotels here. Which one? I got that one written down, too. Oh, how can anybody be this stupid? Please, Albert, don't start picking on me. Then why don't you tend to business? I am. Well, you didn't even remember the guy's name or where he lived. Well, I can't remember everything. Do you know that you've messed up the last three suckers in a row? But I didn't... That little bird brain of yours is sending us right to the cleaners. <laughs> oh, now, don't start that. Well, I can't help it. Oh, Rose, will you cut it out? Well, then you stop mean to me. Okay, okay. <laughs> Where's the paper with the guy's name and address? In my purse. Well, get it. We're calling him right now. Edith! Edith! What is it? Oh, oh I'm sorry, dear. I, I didn't know you were resting. What did you want? I just received a phone call. What's exciting about that? It was from that young dame who tried to promote me on the train. 
How did she know where to find you? Well, I told her I would be staying here. You mean you had the nerve... Oh, now, just a minute. Let me explain. I'm familiar with her pitch. That's why I wanted her to call me. Look, when are you going to work? I am working. You what? Let me tell you this girl's proposition. She's using the option swindle. We each put up $5,000, give it to her lawyer. That old bromide. <laughs> Darling, I think we can put it to good use. What do you mean? Well, while she's so busy trying to get our 5000 I think I know a way to get hers. That's very unethical. Edith. There's enough legits around. We don't have to clip anybody in our own business. But she approached us. Money you get that way never does you any good. Look, you've been nagging me for weeks to get into action. Now that I've got a live proposition, you back down. I just don't like it. $5,000, my dear. A very tidy sum. Oh, I know. We can have it in our pockets before the day is over. What makes you think it would be that easy? Oh, they're completely vulnerable. We know their game. They don't even suspect us. What's the setup? <laughs> the girl asked me to meet her in front of her hotel. She said that she would then take me to see a Mr. Albert, a lawyer. <laughs> he lives at the hotel, too. And when does all this happen? One o'clock. Now, what do you say, darling? Remember, I guarantee results. You're to bring your own 5000 That's right. And who supplies that? Well, uh, you do, my dear. That I don't go for. Look, I merely use it to impress them. They never get their hands on my money. But I... Darling, this will be the quickest turnover we've ever made. Jim? No, I'm afraid not, Carl. Did you interview the conductor? Yes, I described the girl to him. He said he remembered her very well, but she got off the train at Colorado Springs. Well, how about the man who works with her? Well, the conductor didn't remember anyone answering to his description. I don't imagine he was on the train anyway. Mm, why not? Well, their pattern in the past has been for her to work the train alone and meet him at whatever town they're using for the swindle. Oh, I see. However, the conductor did recall her talking to a very distinguished-looking gray-haired man in a club car. Uh-oh. You a victim? Could be. Carl, it looks as if we're going to have to take a quick trip to Colorado Springs. Hello. Ah, there you are, my dear. Hello. I'm delighted to see you again, Miss Dixon. Thank you. Well, are you ready to go see my lawyer? Oh, not just yet, my dear. Let's... Let's tarry here in this delightful garden for a few more moments. Okay. Would you like to sit down? I'd love to. <laughs> Did you bring the money? Yes, my dear. I have it right here. You see? Oh, swell. Have you your 5000 Oh, sure. Right here in my purse. Look. Splendid. You look very lovely today, my dear. Honest? I'm so glad that you called me. Really? I had hoped that we'd meet again. Gee. Yeah. Miss Dixon. Uh, Colonel. Yes? Call me Rose. That would be a great privilege. Incidentally, uh, my given name is Frederick. Oh, oh, that's cute. Rose, let's have lunch before we go to see our lawyer. There's something I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Is your name Mr. Albert? That's right. You're a lawyer? Yes. Have you got a client named Rose Dixon? I have. Who are you? Well, my name is Lansing. I'm uh, looking for my husband, Colonel Lansing. I believe he had a date here with you earlier today. He had a date, all right, but he never showed up. What? Neither is my client. Wait a minute. What are you trying to pull? Pull? My husband came here with five grand. I tell you, he never arrived. Look, you might as well know this now. I'm hep to the fact you're running a store here. So is my husband. What are you talking about? We knew all about your swindle. That's our business, too. Now, what did you do with him? Look, for the last time, lady, I tell you that the guy didn't show. Well, then where is he? He's got my 5000 Well, if it's any consolation to you, Rose has got 5000 that belongs to me. Yes? Telegram. Just a second. Here. Thanks. Look... I want to know... Quiet, lady. I want to read this. It's got to be from Rose. She's the only one who knows I'm here. Yeah, it is from her. Listen to this. By the time you get this, Colonel Lansing's wife will probably be at your place looking for him. 
If she is there, here is a message from me and the colonel for both of you. Drop dead. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women on the way up. Imagine yourself leaving your boss's office, walking on air. Thanks again, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, boy, a raise and a chance to go to the home office. Oh, wait till I tell Peggy. Yes, I'm talking to that one man in ten who has confidence in himself and in his future. If you're that man, then be sure to get life insurance that's designed to order for you. Investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now than they are today. You're talking my language, Mr. Keating. I'd like life insurance to take my future success into consideration. That's exactly what the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up does. It gives you these three advantages. First, it provides you and your family with needed protection right now. Second, this equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. Can expand or contract as you see fit. That sounds like the plan for me. I'd like to look into it. Okay. Identify yourself as a man on the way up by asking your Equitable Society representative for full information on this plan. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Henpecked Swindler. The victims of the swindle in tonight's case from the files of your FBI could not go to the police and complain because they were criminals themselves. But this case does point up an important object lesson to every law-abiding citizen in the country. Every year, Americans are swindled out of hundreds of thousands of dollars by various types of confidence men. Confidence men who are more successful than they should be because the great majority of their victims do not report the crime to their local police. People who have been swindled keep the matter a personal secret because they feel that to make it public would subject them to ridicule. But those victims do not realize that by their silence, they enable the swindler to carry on his career. So your FBI wishes to pass on this bit of advice. If it should be your misfortune to become the victim of a swindle, Immediately do your part in stopping the swindlers from working on anyone else. Notify your local police. Tonight's file continues in a hotel lobby in Colorado Springs. Special Agent Taylor is standing near the newsstand as his fellow agent, Carl Maywood, approaches. <laughs> Oh, Jim, uh, oh, Carl. Did you come up with something here? Yes, I've just spoken to the manager, Carl. I described the man we're looking for. He recognized him as someone who checked in two days ago. I see. This man described himself as a lawyer. He engaged in the joining room for a girl who arrived last night. Well, did the manager see her? Yes. She was wearing morning clothes. Well, right? this certainly sounds like we came to the right place. Yes. And then this morning, the so-called lawyer withdrew $5,000 that he'd been keeping in the hotel safe. If they're about to use the cash, then they're approaching the kill. Right. Where are they now? They're both out. Mm, too bad we can't find out who the victim is. I have an idea. It's that man she was talking to on the train. At least one of the bellhops saw the girl out in the garden this noon, talking to a distinguished-looking gray-haired man. You know, Jim, they may be out permanently. Yes, that may be. In fact, if they've already scored, they may be on their way out of town. Yes, I know, Carl. Look, you drive over to the railroad station, see if they've bought transportation. I'll hop down and get a search warrant to examine their rooms. <laughs> How'd you make out? 
I just talked to the ticket seller. Well? You say your husband is tall, gray-haired, a flowing mustache? That's him. Well, he bought two tickets for San Francisco. A woman who looked like my wife, Rose, was with him. San Francisco, huh? Yeah, that's right. Now, where would he go when he got there? Any idea? Now, look, this is important. Don't you want to get your dough back? Wait a minute. Huh? I just remembered something. We're not going to San Francisco. Rose? Yes, Frederick? Another bonbon? Gee, thanks. Mmm. You know something, my dear? What? I can't tell you how pleased I am about us. I think I know what you mean. Nobody picking on us, huh? Exactly. <laughs> I sure would have liked to have seen Albert's face when he got that wire. <laughs> <laughs> I think Edith would have been an interesting study, too. <laughs> you know, Albert used to all the time tell me how stupid I was. Really? Yeah. He used to say that I did everything wrong. <laughs> Edith's complaint was that I never did anything. So uh, we take them both for $10,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frederick. Yes, my love? Do you think I'm stupid? Of course. I wouldn't have you be anything else. That's the sweetest thing I ever heard. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. Where are you? Down at the railroad station. I searched the swindler's room. It looks like they've checked out. I found that out down here. No, oh, how? The girl was here earlier today, accompanied by a tall, gray-haired man. Hmm? From his description, it sounded more like the victim than the other swindler. Yes. They bought two tickets for San Francisco over two hours ago. I see. About an hour later, a male half of the swindling team turned up here. Uh -huh. The ticket seller said he was very anxious to find out about the girl, and he acted quite upset when he heard he'd missed her. Carl, did he buy a ticket, too? No. It sort of looks like she's run out with a victim, don't you think, Jim? Well, he isn't exactly a victim. And what do you mean? I checked with the police, gave them the gray-haired man's description, hoping to save him from being taken. They tell me he's an old-time swindler himself, that they have a warrant for his arrest on an old charge. Well. So it looks like some sort of double cross is in the works, Carl. Yeah. Look, now that our original team is separated, I think we should concentrate on tracking down the girl. At least we know she's headed for San Francisco. Now, she'll have to change at Denver, so I'll call our office and have them pick her up. Chauffeur to take it easy, will you? Okay. Drives him. Yeah. Ease up on the turns, will you? Right. How much further to Denver? Oh, I'd say about another 20 miles. How long did you rent this car for? Just for the day. Look, what makes you think that Rose and your husband will be in Denver? My husband is a creature of habit. He always follows the same pattern. So? So, whenever he's been hot in the past, he always bought a ticket to some far-off place, and then he'd get off at the first stop along the way. Well, supposing he still does that. Denver's a big city. He'll still follow his pattern. He always stops at the same hotel. I know the one he'll go to in Denver. I hope so. Look, our happy little families will be reunited before the day is over. <laughs> Oh, Jim. Oh, come on in, Carl. Hotel manager let me use his office. Did you get the call through? To our office? That's right. I've already gotten a reply. And did they get the girl off the train? No, they were too late. Did she get on the San Francisco train? Nope. That puts us right back where we started. I know, but inasmuch as we've lost track of her, I think we should concentrate now on the other half of the team. Oh. Well, I have an idea, Carl. Now, here's what I think we should do. Dear. Yes, Frederick. Well, how do you like your new quarters? Oh, this is a wonderful room. I'm just across the hall, so you can always feel that I'm nearby. Well, mm. tired? Mm, no, not really. I'd like to get a good night's rest, though, because I want to get up early and do lots of shopping. I had the very same thing in mind. Would you believe it? Edith didn't buy me as much as a necktie in the past three years. Albert was just as stingy. Well, you can rest assured that we will. Oh, that must be the drinks I ordered. Just a moment. Hello, sucker. Edith. 
surprised? Uh, what are you doing here? Now, what do you think? Where's my wife? Oh, why, she's... Frederick, who is it? It's me, Rose. <gasps> your husband, remember? Oh, golly. Well, get out of the way and let us in. Well, now, now, just a minute. Stand but... aside. How did you know where we were? Oh, that was a cinch, sweetheart. I knew this husband of mine would be lazy enough to follow the same old pattern. And I knew you'd be stupid enough to go along with it. Frederick, what do we do? Well, I... Uh, well, I... for openers... You're giving us back our dough. Oh, no. Come on, get it up, both of you. Now, see here, this whole thing is very unethical. Quit stalling. Give us our dough. Sorry to intrude on this little family oh, party. Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? We've been looking for all four of you for months on charges of violating the National Stolen Property Act. How did you know where to find us? I found you because of your husband. I knew he was looking for you, so I checked all means of transportation out of Colorado Springs. When I found he had hired a car, the rest was easy. Well, Albert? Huh? Who's stupid now? All four suspects were sentenced to long terms in a federal prison for violating the National Stolen Property Act. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI, which closed the careers of all four notorious criminals, illustrates again the great value of the training received by every special agent before he becomes a qualified member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. During that period of training, the potential special agent is taught how to evaluate bits of information and also taught that the second investigation of any clue will often turn up some information that was not available the first time. Because of that training and that diligence, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has become one of the most successful law enforcement agencies in the world. And that should make you proud. Because this governmental organization belongs to you. It is your FBI. <laughs> In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. Or how much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Wayward Brothers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wayward Brothers on This Is Your FBI. Last week, $4,050 was won on Break the Bank. Stay tuned as contestants try for another fabulous jackpot on Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents this 
is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. This can happen to you tonight. You're listening to this program when... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? Yes, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about their life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. So naturally, I know that this is your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes... I'll give all you people who are on the way up full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Unfortunate Daughter. prides itself on the fact that one of the things which has helped to make the Bureau an internationally famous crime-solving agency is that it has made a study of the criminal mind. One of the results of that study has been the realization that in the case of most criminals, they commit every crime according to the same pattern, time after time. That knowledge has helped your FBI in many of its most complex cases. But occasionally, a criminal appears who is more difficult to catch, who varies not only his pattern, but his crime. He does not fall into the obvious trap. He uses his cunning to avoid being caught. And sometimes, his plan works for a while. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small town in one of our southern states. On one of the tree-lined streets of this village, a car is parked. A woman is seated alone behind the wheel. The car motor is idling. Suddenly, from a nearby side street, hurried footsteps are heard. A man appears. He runs swiftly to the car, opens the rear door. Get moving. Where's Charlie? He didn't make it. Move, will you? Head to the highway, then drive north to Richmond. Right. I want to stay down on the floor here. Don't drive fast. We don't want nobody stopping us. Okay. What happened? We uh, blew everything. Didn't you even get into the bank? Sure. Almost had the dough in our mitts. What went wrong? A local cop was in there. He pumped three slugs into Charlie. Did he get it bad? They were in their head. Oh. I uh, squared it a little, though. I, I got the cop. No help. How does the road look? No trouble. You know, this puts us in a tight box. We ain't holding. No dough at all? Uh, not even enough to bail us out of that rooming house in Richmond. Oh, why? You on the highway yet? A couple of more blocks. Hey, I just thought of something. What? Big Charlie might bail us out. Rose, I told you. He got three slugs in I his... don't mean personally. He's got a tin box he always carried around with him. Must be something of value in it. I never seen it. Back in his room in Richmond. Could be full of cash. All we need is getaway dough. When we get back there, we'll tap it out. Coming. This should do it now. Yeah. Well, I don't see any mountain of green stuff. No, let's hear some of these papers. Dump the whole thing on here. Okay. Still no cash, Ruthie. No, I'll look in some of these envelopes. Oh, look here. 
bunch of pictures. Snapshots of a young dame. Look for the money. I don't think you'll find any. Why did Big Charlie carry this box every place? Must have some value. Ruthie, there's nothing but pictures, newspaper clippings. Oh, look at this. A birth certificate. Now, what do you know? What? This birth certificate. It says, Claudia Pierce, daughter of Charles and Ethel Pierce. Charlie had a daughter. But all these pictures must be of her. I never knew he had a kid. Nobody did. That's yeah, probably why he put this stuff in the box. He wanted to keep it a secret. None of this gets us out of town. That's what we've got to do in a hurry. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Look at this newspaper clipping. Tom, you're wasting time. Look at it, will you? What? It's a picture from the society page of a Boston paper. Ralph Griffin, prominent socialite, and his bride, Claudia Baker. So? Oh, look at her picture. Compare it with these snapshots here. Same day. Sure. That's Charlie's daughter. He must have changed the name from Pierce to Baker. Look, none of this is helping us. Honey, we can hawk Charlie's clothes and get enough for our fare to Boston. This can help us plenty. <laughs> Jim. Oh, hello, Ken. Jim, I've been looking for you. I want to go over that file in the Bartlett case with you. Ken, I'm afraid I haven't got time right now. I've just been out on a job that requires some immediate attention. What is it? An attempted bank robbery down in Vernon. I've just come from there. What's the story? Two armed men entered the First National at approximately 10 o'clock this morning. Oh? They slugged the teller, but before they could get any money, a local policeman came in. Yes? The bandits opened fire on him. He shot it out with them. He killed one of the men. The other one killed him. I see. What happened to the surviving bandit, Jim? He got away. He evidently had a Confederate someplace in town with a car. There's been no trace of him since. Has an alarm been sent out? Yes, but we have only a very vague description on him. I don't think it'll be any help in turning him up. Did you identify the thief who was killed? Yes, his name was Charlie Pierce. Hmm, I seem to remember him. Well, he was an old-timer. He'd been mixed up in a number of bank jobs in the past. Did you uh, pick up anything there that might lead you to this man who got away? Well, nothing too good. Found a card of matches in the dead man's pocket, though. They advertised a bar and grill right here in Richmond. You think maybe Pierce hung out there? Well, there's a slight chance that he did. I'm going over there now and find out. Hey, get a load of this house. Yeah. Yeah, real quiet. Surprised Charlie didn't put the tap on his daughter himself instead of going around sticking up bank. I know. You know what you're going to say to her? Yeah, just let me handle it. Yes? Uh, I want to see Mrs. Griffin. I'm Mrs. Griffin. Claudia Griffin? That's right. That's swell. We'd, we'd like to come in and talk to you. Who are you? Friends of Charlie. What? Yeah, Charlie Pierce, your father. Uh, can we come in? Yes. Good. Go ahead, Lucy. All right. Anybody home here? No. Uh, uh, what about uh, servants? We have a couple. They're on vacation. Oh, well, that makes it real nice. What is this all about? How did you know who I am? Oh, your pop told us. He said if we ever needed anything, we should look you up. I don't believe you. He, um... Uh... Gave us these old pictures of you. He said that'd be proof enough. Let me see them. Yeah. Now, do you believe us? What do you want? Well, we figured we might sort of move in here for a while. Oh, no. Why not? My husband doesn't know about my father. He's a respectable businessman. Well, so what? We won't tip him off. You can't do this. Honey, you don't have much choice. What? You don't take us in. Then we'll have to tell your husband. Oh. Now, let's sit down and talk this thing over. Ken, that book of matches was a good lead. Really, Jim? Yes, I went to the place that advertised Bill's Bar and Grill. Yes? Showed the bartender a picture of Charlie Pierce. He recognized him immediately. Good. Said he'd been in there quite a good deal in the past three weeks. His constant companions were another man and woman. Evidently his confederates. That's right. The bartender also remembered that Pierce lived in a rooming house right around the corner. Well, that's a break. I went around there and talked to the landlady. She told me that another couple had lived there with Pierce, but they had packed and left around noon today. The bank robbery was at 10? That's right. 
I just about gave him enough time to get back from Vernon. Yes, I know. I got a good description of him from the landlady, though. The man had a scar on his face. From his general physical appearance, he sounds like an ex-convict named Tom Dawson. Anything else, Jim? Well, I found this old snapshot on the floor of the room. It obviously belonged to one of the bandits. What is it? A picture of a girl in a graduation gown. It says, love to daddy, signed Claudia. Hmm. Well, I'm going to get Dawson's picture from the files and take it back and show it to the landlady. <laughs> Look, don't you think you've done enough of that cram? Why did you come here? Why? Tommy, we already told you we needed a hideout. Well, you're not going to stay here. You mean you don't care if your husband knows about you? No. Who are you kidding? I mean it. Honey, he's a respectable guy. This could upset him plenty. I don't care. Hey, the car outside. Huh? The guy getting out. That's my husband. Tom, what do we do? Take it easy. She's going to tell him. No, she ain't. Yes, I am. Claudia! Yes, Ralph? Where are you, there? I'll be right there. Good evening, dear. Hello, darling. Hey, what's the matter with you? Well, you've I... been crying. Yes, darling. Why? Ralph, I have something to tell you. Oh, can it wait, honey? I've got something to tell you first. It's the biggest news of the year. But Ralph... Guess who you're talking to right now. I'll give you one guess, honey. Ralph, You're I... talking to the new vice president of the bank. What do you think of that? Oh. They just told me right before I came home. Isn't it wonderful, honey? Oh, yes. I couldn't wait to... Hello. Hello. Uh, aren't we going to meet your husband, honey? Ralph, this is Mr. and Mrs. Dawson. Oh. How do you do? Hello. Hi. The Dawsons know my father. I've asked them to stay a few weeks here with us. Oh. open tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now a special message to men and women who are on the way up. To those of you who are confident that sometime soon you'll be making a telephone call like this. Hello? Hello? Is that you, Beth? Listen, there was a surprise in my pay envelope today. Yes, a raise. A big one. Now you know what I mean by men on the way up. Men who are going to get somewhere or know the reason why. If you're that man, then make sure you have insurance designed to order for you. Right now, investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money five years from now. I get it. This plan is elastic so a man can make changes when his ship comes in. Exactly right. And that's just one of several advantages of this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. First... It gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times. can expand or contract as you see fit. Okay, Mr. Keating. I've got enough faith in my future to want to look into this plan. What do I do first? Just get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Phone him for full information on the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Unfortunate Daughter. It happens every so often that a decent, honest citizen is called upon to make a choice between some unpleasant publicity and the condoning of a crime. In many cases, the decent citizen becomes a victim of fear and panic, loses his ordinary sense of judgment, and decides to do business with the criminal. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is an example of just that. And it is difficult to say that in the same position, any of us would be inclined to do differently. 
However, the experience of your FBI has shown that year after year and case after case, the decent citizen who chose to do business with the criminal was hurt because the criminal failed to keep his part of the bargain. Morally, that is wrong. But what the honest law-abiding person forgets is that criminals have no morals. Tonight's file continues at the Richmond field office of the FBI. This early evening, Special Agent Jim Taylor is talking to his fellow agent, Ken Monroe. Well, what did you get from the landlady, Jim? She definitely identified Dawson as the man who lived at her rooming house with Charlie Pierce. I've got further confirmation for you. Oh, how's that, Ken? One of the local police down in Vernon came in right after you left. He had an employee of the bank with him. Yes. I showed him Dawson's picture. He recognized him as the other bandit. Good. I put out an alarm on him. I know where he's gone. Really? Yes. As soon as I knew who we were looking for, I went to the railroad station, bus line, and airport. Well? The ticket seller at the airport recognized Dawson from his picture. He sold him two tickets to Boston on the one o'clock plane. Let's see. It's after eight now. Yeah, it's too late to contact the Boston airport. He's already gotten there. What's the next move? We'll notify the Boston office. Send out an alarm on Dawson and tell him we're on our way. <laughs> Yes, sir. You have some more coffee? Uh, thanks, I will. Are the Dawson still sleeping? Yes. How about some more toast, dear? No, I have plenty, thanks. Ralph, if you get a chance today, I wish Wait. You... What? This picture here on the front page. Claudia, look at it. What is it? It's your friend Dawson. What? I'm sure of it. Look. Oh. He's wanted in connection with a bank robbery. He tried to hold up a bank in Richmond yesterday. He and a female companion eluded the police and took a plane here to Boston. I see. Another bandit named Pierce was killed on the job. Oh, no. Honey, we've got to call the police at once. Just stay where you are, mister. Uh, You're not calling any cops. Why didn't you tell me that my father had been killed? I didn't want you to feel bad. (laughs) Claudia, what's this all about? (laughs) Answer me. Well, you want me to tell him? No. No, I'll tell him. Claudia, what is this? The man who was killed, Ralph. The other bank bandit. He was my father. What? That's why these people are here. They wanted to hide out from the police, and they threatened to tell you about my father if I didn't shelter them. Oh, honey, why didn't you tell me? I was going to, Ralph. I'd made up my mind to tell you as soon as you came home. What stopped you? When you told me what had happened at the bank, that you'd been made vice president, I knew then that if the truth about my father came out, you'd be ruined. And she has a good point there, Mr. Griffin. This is awful. It'll be a lot worse if you call the cops. Just uh, think that over. Ken, I just talked to the agent in charge. Any development? No, the police here in Boston have contacted all hotels, tourist camps, rooming houses, and no one answering to Dawson's description has been seen. Well, he must have had some specific reason for coming here. It's probably a hideout. Yes. The local papers have cooperated. Most of them carried his picture on the front page. That might get results. I sure hope so. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. Yes, I see. Well, what was that address again, please? 47 Rand Drive. Thanks a lot, sir. We'll get right out there. A break, Ken. What? One of the local agents had been working all morning out at the airport. He finally ran across a cab driver who identified Dawson's picture. Good. His trip record shows that he took them to an address out in the suburbs late yesterday afternoon. You have the address? Yes, let's go. What's the name of the man who lives here again, Jim? Ralph Griffin. Pretty impressive looking house. Mm-hmm. Strange place for someone like Dawson to come to. Yeah, I know. Yes? Is Mr. Griffin here, please? Who wishes to see him? Now, we're special agents of the FBI. Oh. They're my credentials. I see. Are you Mrs. Griffin? Yes. Just a moment. I'll call my husband. Thank you. Ralph? Yes, Claudia? There's some men from the FBI to see you. FBI? 
Yes, sir, at the front door. Looks like that's where we're going to stay, Ken. Yes. Hello? Mr. Griffin? What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Griffin, we're looking for a man named Dawson. We have information that he and a woman came here to your address yesterday afternoon. Dawson? That's right. I'm sorry, I've never heard of him. Would they have come here to see anyone else? Oh, I'm afraid not. My wife and I are the only ones here. Our servants are on vacation. Oh. Well, looks like we got a bad lead. Sorry, gentlemen. Oh, thank you anyway, sir. Not at all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Come on, Ken. You think we should get a warrant and come back here? No, I just remembered something. We got some work to do at the office first. Anything gone? Yes. Nice work, Mr. Griffin. I didn't relish it, believe me. Ralph, I'm sorry. This is all my fault. Oh, it's no one's fault, Claudia. But I'm not putting up with this any longer. What do you mean by that, mister? You and your husband are getting out of here. Are you kidding? No. Regardless of the consequences, you're not spending another night in my house. Look, we're staying as long... Hold it, honey. Hold it. I uh, think we better do like he says. Oh, thank heaven. It ain't for your sake. It's for ours. What do you mean, Tom? The heat is on. Those guys will be back. You think so? Sure. The next time they'll have a warrant. Where do we go? I don't know yet. What will we use for money? That part is easy. How? Mr. Griffin here is in the banking business. What do you mean by that? You're giving us some getaway dough. Oh, no. We need $5,000. We want it this afternoon. You're not getting it from me. Look, I'm letting you off easy. For five grand, you get rid of it. I'm getting rid of you the way I should have, right from the beginning. I'm going to call the FBI and tell them you're here. No, you're not. Keep away from that phone. Get out of my way. Not a chance. <laughs> I will talk business again when he comes to. <laughs> Jim. Oh, yes, Ken. I checked up on Ralph Griffin. Good. He's legitimate, all right. He works for one of the banks here in town. Did you get all the details on his background? Yes, I have them right here. Fine. Oh, uh, anything there about his wedding? Here's a newspaper clipping on it. I got it from the morgue at one of the local papers. May I see it? Sure. Thanks. Ralph Griffin, prominent socialite, and his bride, Claudia Baker. What's this all about, Jim? You remember that graduation picture I found in the rooming house in Richmond? Uh, yes. I brought it along in my briefcase. Yeah, here it is right here. Well? Compare it with this picture, Griffin's bride. Hey, it's the same girl. That's right. Now, let's see if this newspaper article tells us where the bride went to school. Um, there it is, Jim. State College. Yeah. Let's contact them at once and see what they can give us on a background. Should have a good deal of bearing on this case. Try to move, darling. Just lie still. How is he doing? Please get away. Look, we have some business to take care of, remember? Leave him alone. They're coming through? Yeah. Oh, my, my head. Just take it easy, darling. Ready to talk yet, Mr. Griffin? What? I'd like to know about that 5000 Oh, you're still here. Naturally. Now, how about that dough? I'm not giving it to you. Maybe you'd like another treat? Yeah. Keep away from him. We ain't got much time. How about it, mister? No. Okay. Wait! Yeah. I'll get you the money. Claudia. I can't let him hit you again. Where is the dough? In that desk. Claudia, come back here. Ralph, I've got to do this. No! Just stay put, mister. Let me go. Take it easy. <laughs> mister, you better do like he says. He'll only get hurt again. Are you coming with that dough? I'm getting it. Oh, Claudia, don't. Go see what she's doing, Ruth. She's coming back now. Here. Here's your money. Swell. It's a little over 4000 That's all there is. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. We've got something to tend to first. Please go. And have you blow a whistle on us the minute we're out of the door? We ain't that stupid. I promise you we won't. That is worth exactly nothing. Claudia, he has a gun. That's right. I'm using it, too. No, wait! Hey! There we are, Dawson. It's the FBI. That's right. Ken! Ken, are you in there? Yes, stay put, everyone. Jim, can you open that window? Yeah. Yeah, I can manage. Ken, Ken, get his gun, will you? Yeah. Oh, I'm grateful that you're here, sir. Well, we came back because we checked at your wife's school. We learned there who her father was. That more or less explained everything. I'd say we returned just in time. Four 
for his wanton murder of the bank guard, Tom Dawson was tried and convicted on the charge of first-degree murder. For serving as his accomplice, Dawson's wife, Ruth, was sentenced to serve 20 years in the penitentiary. And thus, two people who had committed bank robbery, murder, and blackmail were stopped from pursuing their criminal careers. Because they changed their crimes and their patterns, they were difficult criminals to catch. But they were caught because your FBI does not discourage easily nor quickly. Once a criminal escaped and remained at large for 16 long years, but your FBI never closed the file on him. And in due time, that criminal, like the ones in tonight's case, learned that so long as law enforcement agencies like your FBI are on the job, crime will forever be an unprofitable occupation. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Henpecked Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpeck Swindler on This Is Your FBI. Here's a reminder. Daylight saving time starts next Sunday in many sections of the country. But regardless of which time zone you live in, this program will continue to be broadcast at the same time by your clock that you heard it today. There is $4,050 in Break the Bank's jackpot. Stay tuned now for radio's biggest money-paying show, Break the Bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.